Nurse, come in, please, where are you? Fuck it, he's dead. Oh shit, there's a horse in the hospital. Muchísimo otra vez. A ver, pero bueno, esto, ¿eh? No muy bueno, muy bueno. Ya se va a meter a la nube, se va a meter a la nube, ¿no? Sí. Ya se metió. Oh. ¿Qué es ¿Por qué dejó de brillar y luego otra vez? Con la gente, pues ella. Sí, ya salió entre las dos nubes. Ah, sí, ahí va, ahí va, ahí va. Ahí está. ¿Ya se volvió a meter o qué? Sí. Pero va a salir del otro lado, mira, ahí se ve la nube. mit 51 über Kalifornien. Hier Teleskopaufnahmen von Professor George Adamski.
in the United States and in Britain would wish this thing would go away. Well, it won't. And it's going to get bigger and bigger. And I ask you to stay tuned because you're going to see some things in the next few months, in the next couple of years. They're going to shake you up completely. El sol salió anoche y me cantó. El sol salió anoche y me cantó. He says the sun came out last night. He says it sang to him. <laughs>
patient Pull out the skull, remove the cancer Breaking his back, chisel next for the answer Supersonic, bionic, robot, voodoo power Use myself because you are wondering who is this uh, person. Uh, um, my name is Gustavo Leclerc, and I'm um, uh, the coordinator of a program here in Sayac that hopefully uh, uh, you will find uh, more about it in the near future. The program is CD Practice and Research Center, and just briefly at the expense of uh, Ruben's introduction, I want to. Uh, take two minutes to talk about this program, uh, which is, is based on, on Los Angeles, and it's a community-based work um, that takes the form of studios, uh, workshops, uh, seminars, thesis, and independent study, um, where the students um, work in a range of urban neighborhoods um, and, and furthering their understanding of the social, political, and aesthetic uh, practices of community design uh, uh, and build projects. Um, uh, but within this framework, some of the uh, uh, larger issues that are addressed through this, uh, uh, the City Practice and Research Center, or uh, also known as CPRC, uh, is issues of affordable housing, urbanization, sustainability, and immigration. Um, and, and this coming summer, we are going to have two uh, uh, workshops uh, uh, or uh, studios. Um, so if you have any more questions uh, about this program, um, uh, please contact me. Um, um, and probably in the, in the website, in Sayar's website, you could find uh, uh, where to contact me. Um, now, about Ruben. Um, when I called him last week, um, asking him for um, what should I say about, or how should I introduce him, uh, he basically said, well, you say that um, uh, 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 I'm an artist that uh, really wanted to be a, a professional baseball player or an architect. Um, so, um, and, and then digging into uh, my files, I found a very interesting bio that he gave me a couple of years ago for a project, for a publication uh, that, uh, um, that we put together, um, which I thought it fits very perfect with, to with, with uh, tonight's uh, presentation and performance. And, and Ruben Ortiz Torre was born in Mexico City in 1960 something. 64, um, educated, 64, yeah. Educated within the utopian models of Republican Spanish anarchism, soon confronted the tragedies and cultural clashes of post-colonial third world. Being the son of a couple of Latin American folk musicians, and I would say that very, uh, uh, probably the most, uh, uh, there were, uh, Funders are the, probably the most well-known uh, 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 music group uh, of Latin American folk music um, in Latin America. Um, uh, he soon identified more with the noises of urban punk music. After giving up the dream of playing baseball in the major leagues, and specifically with the Dodgers, that's what I've been told, uh, the suicide of close friends and some architectural uh, training, uh, Harvard uh, GSD, 
uh, he decided to study art. Uh, first, he went to the oldest and one of the most academic art schools in the Americas, uh, the Academy of San Carlos in Mexico City, and later to one of the newest and more experimental Cal Arts um, here in California, in Valencia. After enduring Mexico City's earthquake and pollution, he moved to Los Angeles with a Fulbright Fellowship to survive riots, fires, floods, more earthquakes, and Proposition 187. During all this, he has been able to produce artwork in the form of paintings, photographs, objects, installations, videos, and films, and lately, uh, as you saw in some of the uh, uh, videos, customized low rider cars. He has participated in several international exhibitions and film festival, festivals, and his work is in the collection of uh, many uh, museums, uh, among them the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Metropolitan also in New York, uh, the Los Angeles County Museum, the California Museum of Photography in Riverside, El Centro Cultural de Arte Contemporáneo en, en, en la Ciudad de México, El Museo Nacional Centro de Arte Reina Sofía en Madrid, Spain, and recently, and I hope that he presents some of the uh, uh, work in progress for a, uh, a, a recently commissioned uh, project uh, uh, by the Getty Center. Um, and 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 I, I, when he told me about it, uh, it, sounded, it, 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 I got very excited because it uh, uh, combines many issues. I mean, growing up in Mexico and with issues of Latin American. Uh, uh, politics uh, and it's what he told me is it's a, it's a Che Guevara low rider uh, car. So um, hopefully he will uh, show um, some of that work in programs. And to conclude, after showing his work around many different parts uh, or, or uh, living abroad, uh, he now realizes that his dad's music was in fact better than most contemporary rock and roll. So um, please welcome Ruben, uh, Ortiz Torres. Um, and, and there's going to be a, 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 a more presentation. Right? And, and, well, first of all, I would like to introduce oh. also uh, my friend that collaborated today uh, with, with me, is uh, Constantino. So you talk. And uh, we're doing this. This is one that actually really put the whole uh, show. And, uh, yeah, we're uh, working on these experiments with live video. He's a BJ uh, from Canada, from Vancouver, Canada. And hopefully we'll form this group that so far we're calling low-res crimes. But anyway, uh, I'm going to show you guys some examples of different bodies of work. Uh, I, the bodies of work that I will show are very eclectic, and I'm going to try to because of that, I'm going to try to narrow it to the most recent stuff that sort of, um, yeah, I don't know, that is less, less broad, right? Like, that would focus into something more clear. And, uh, uh, well, like what you guys saw uh, was originally was this, uh, was this tape uh, called uh, Alien Toy, uh, which was based, uh, as the tape explains, on, on this machine, on this lowrider car. Uh, that existed actually before it was called Wicked Beth, Wicked Beth, and uh, that was designed by this law writer uh, uh, that, I'm, that I work with, whose name is uh, Salvador Muñoz, Salvador Chava Muñoz. Uh, and then we did this um, puppet show uh, that it was hard for me to see with my glasses fogged and all that, but uh, the, the basically what this, the story tells, uh, what the computer is telling, uh, it's sort of a uh, Something that I noticed when I was working with Salvador, and actually not just with Salvador, but like working in general with the lowrider community, is that there are these very sort of interesting parallelisms between how the lowriders see what they do and, and how the art world operates, right? And you have your traditionalists, you have your avant-garde. Uh, usually we think of lowriders in terms of this sort of narrative form that's full of symbolism, that feels all these things. Yet, there's, there's certain other uh, customizers that uh, do uh, like, for example, more abstract painting, right? To concentrate on patterns and, 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 and uh, pinstripping as opposed to narrative neurons, right? 
uh, some other ones do, I mean the whole, well, first of all I must say that uh, when I came to California and I went to one of these car shows, uh, I, was, I was totally overwhelmed by the complexity of these uh, machines and this whole thing, right? Uh, I mean compared to the, yeah, I was going to school uh, looking at experimental artwork and yet when I would go to these things I would see these installations that were really interdisciplinary and would mix everything. Uh, over the top, by the way, and the volume very high, and you know they would they would incorporate uh, mural paintings and uh, the cars would that. I mean, there was a performative aspect of it. There was a sculptural aspect to it. There was a painterly aspect to it. There was uh, there was fashion, music, everything related to it. But anyway, um, then I saw this car that was definitely like kind of like an outcast in the context of the car shows, right? And this car, uh, it had to have its own uh, special category. They had to invent a category for it, which was radical bed dancing that didn't exist before. And that he keep on winning on, like he won it like five times in a row. So, uh, yet he was still was kind of frustrated that somehow he wouldn't get the recognition that a classic Chevy Impala would get, right? Like a classic Chevy Impala that would be customized in, the, in a traditional way. Well, traditional according to the writer standards, right? Uh, uh, he, he would, I mean, these cars would get the cover of Lowrider magazine and the centerfold. While he is, despite the fact that he added 16 pumps and was able to split the car and, I don't know, do all the things that you guys saw, uh, it would become like, <laughs> like this sort of freak show it would need, right? Uh, it would get attention, but it wouldn't get this, uh, this other attention, right? Uh, and of course, at, at the time of the crisis, uh, uh, then, then, it, then it was when the art world came to, this <laughs> to, to, to the appropriation. Well, not really. You know, we spoke and I said, listen, Salvador, what you are doing, I think it's incredible. I think these guys are not prepared. I think you're really uh, moving this thing toward uh, pushing the boundaries of what our car customizing is, and uh, lowrider cars in particular. Uh, I thought his car was, as you guys saw it, uh, this very, very sort of contemporary thing that uh, where, you know, it's, it's basically deconstructs what a car is, right? Like what a car does. And, and almost creates this kind of cubist uh, mechanic ballet, or I don't know how to describe it. I mean, that's the way I, I, I talk within the text, right? Like, reminding me of this, this mechanic ballet. Um, there's another, when we dance it now, when we perform, we use this, um, another friend of mine, this composer, wrote what he called a cubist mambo, and then he got this Ferris Prado song. And, and created this avant-garde thing, like with uh, electronic uh, music, he created this sort of um, uh, avant-garde piece where he splices the song, and, and somehow I think works really well with a car. You know, we have this thing that it's uh, and then of course, all of a sudden we started. For some reason, it sort of brought to my mind that somehow a lot of the artists that I regard as more, uh, as you know, more important or that were considered like you know the pioneers. And, uh, and you know, in the avant-garde, were actually uh, had kind of a similar condition that uh, that Salvador had, and in a way that I sort of share with him, because Salvador, to a certain degree, uh, within the context of the lowrider community, he was kind of an outsider. He he was not somebody that grew up in the barrios here, that would that I don't know, listening to all this and and customizing these cars or having these cars in the garage. He's a guy that came from Jalisco and saw the cars and then did his own interpretation of the thing. Which, by the way, it's already an interpretation of the other American car. So, right? so they give it like a mutation of a mutation, right? And, and if I'm already fascinated by the original mutation, then the second mutation too, and, and of course, there's all these other uh, levels of mutation, I guess, and now there's a third, a fourth, and we we'll keep on adding, right? But uh, uh, then I saw, well, because Salvador, perhaps, when he came, did not understand, or, or at this, I don't know, that might be one hypothesis, or did not have anything at stake when he built his thing, he created this concoction that definitely was uh, apart from the other ones, right? Uh, he didn't even customize an American car, which is, would be, could be considered kind of a blasphemy, right? I mean, he, he customized a Nissan pickup truck. I mean, it wasn't even a Toyota, <laughs> a Toyota mini truck. He customized a Nissan. So he created this thing, and, um, and, and I, you know, I, then I started thinking that it was true, that, that a lot of artists, uh, in order to do these major breakthroughs, they have to be outside. I mean, they have been outsiders. They've been in another context other than where they are from. 
where Picasso, as a Spanish artist, living in France, or Duchamp moving to New York, being in a French, and so on, right? We have all this displacement. I mean, we could say the same thing about Man Ray being an American going to Paris, or, and, and so on. So then I, well, I mentioned, well, there's this connection, right? So then we talk about that. So that's what somehow uh, the text uh, says, uh, right? And talks about, you know, this, uh, uh, the fact, well, about that, right? Like, you know, how, how there's these different cultural interpretations and creations when you change the dislocate yourself and you move around. Um, I'm, I'm going to start, like, let's see if this uh, works out. Okay. Uh, this, this, these are, like, some photographs um, that I did. It's a, it's a photographic body of work. Uh, I should say that my training, uh, believe it or not, actually it was quite academical, very, very academical. And I trained as a, I was trained as a painter, really. And, and uh, I did curative paintings, and I spent years drawing. And I still like to do it. I don't have the time to do it anymore, I guess. But, but I really uh, like to do it. And eventually, at some point, I started doing photography to sort of uh, complement my artwork. But then I realized that the photo by itself would do. Uh, this portfolio I started doing when I came to the, to the States, right? And, Somehow, there was this, for me, when I was at school here, and I would present my work, uh, I found that, that if I would present a painting, it was always perceived that something that somehow would have some sort of subjective content, and therefore, uh, it was not, it didn't have too much value in terms of the amount of infor information it could give, right? Um, so, I don't know, basically, if I, I could present anything on a painting, and, and it would be considered, well, that's his whatever, his fantasy or his interpretation or who knows what. Whereas when I would present my photographs, there was this added value of, the, of these objects uh, based on the fact that if I would take photographs in Mexico and I would present them here, it was, oh, he's from there and maybe he does an objective representation of something interesting that is happening there. And amazingly enough, the same thing happened when I would go back to Mexico. All of a sudden, they wanted to see Los Angeles through my photographs. And for other perfect reasons, I was taking photographs like this, that I don't think quite really represent Mexico or quite really represent LA either, right? In fact, it was taken in Southern, California, in Southern Carolina, in a place called uh, Side of the Border, uh, which is next to, is, is where the border of South, South Carolina, uh, of course, in the border between South Carolina and North Carolina, uh, south of the border, uh, there used to be this beer stand that turned out into this big uh, park, right? Uh, so somehow, uh, so I took this photograph, and then, for example, I would have another photograph like this one, right? This one, which could seem, well, maybe it's the real thing, right? As opposed to the other guy. But this guy uh, actually took this photograph in Guatemala, in, in the border of Guatemala next to Mexico, and, and he functions kind of similarly like, in the, like the other photograph in the sense that uh, here we have this Guatemalan, um, is a Guatemalan native dance that is called the Dance of the Mexicans, where a Guatemalan guy dresses in this sort of uh, stereotypical uh, representation of a Mexican uh, guy that probably came from the Mexican movies that are shown there, where like, you, know, you see these Mexican singers drinking tequila and with a gun. And, but it's, it almost becomes this meta representation, right? Where he wears this mask, this dark skin mask over you know, dark skin already. And, 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 and we have this thing. So, but in a way, of course, I think these two photographs sort of explain how photography works in a sense in the fact that I, photography and representation, I guess, in general, because we have this one where I don't, I don't think this representation really tells me much about Mexico as it does about South Carolina, uh, as, as well as this other one might not tell me much about Mexico as well as it does about uh, Guatemala, which of course uh, reflect the obvious conclusion that we might have known before, that the representation tells us of course always more about who represents that, that what is being represented. But then at the same time, I took those photographs, so then maybe they don't say anything about South Carolina or, or Guatemala for that matter, but about my personal conclusion <laughs> trying to do these things, right? But, uh, Anyway, uh, this is another photograph I took in Campeche, and, and of course this is the this is the symbol of that. <laughs> it turns out that this is the the, the their, their Statue of Liberty is, is what actually is the landmark of this little town in the middle of the jungle, right? And and uh, 
and I start finding all these certain displacements. This one is actually, uh, this one is in, in, uh, in Guatemala, right? And all of a sudden here we have a Statue of Liberty incorporated in the national symbols of Guatemala, right? So the flag and the quetzal. And, and, uh, so it was, you know, then this is Elvez here in LA. This one is an older photograph. This one is a, is a and, and of course I present these images and there's all sort of questions and confusions and uh, this one, this is a shrine, kind of like a shrine that I, this photograph actually I took with, with, with Gustavo on a trip to Las Vegas uh, to see, when we went to see the Super Show and it's a car, it's like a bronze customized by this guy, Crazy George. But it's not the traditional shrine. I mean, there's a lot of photographs of the shrines that you would see in Latin American photography. Uh, this one, of course, it's been, it functions differently. This one, I took it in, in, in Tijuana. And you can see, then again, this obsession with these puppets. But I found these puppets uh, really fascinating because somehow uh, they also present, I mean, I think for me at least, they, they sort of illustrate like some sort of situation that also happens in the art world or in terms of uh, cultural exchanges where somehow when we go on by these puppets, we supposedly are buying some sort of uh, uh, local uh, handcraft. But yet the guys that make these puppets, supposedly, supposedly they are selling us American goods, right? And, and the result is this dark Vader wearing like a salsa, da uh, I don't know, dancing outfit, right? Or, or, or that, or, or in that particular photograph, a Mickey Mouse that does not even have ears, and Minnie that just has one ear, and the proportions are quite odd, and, and, and then again, uh, which almost like, uh, again, when I see these photographs, it's like, it seems to me that it's like Mickey and Minnie before they, they, they crossed over and made, and made it here, right? Uh, this one is another photograph. Then I would go back to Mexico City and I would find these kind of situations, right? And, and this, which is this sort of this, na this nail and this uh, sort of uh, magic realism thing, or I don't know how to describe it, but... And, and of course, I must say that this is not necessarily... The, I mean, of course, this is not the, an objective representation. It's not that all Mexico City looks like this. But there's these parts. And usually they are overseen, because when a photographer from National Geographic goes there, he wants to take whatever he thinks is more Mexican, right? Pretty much the same way when we get to see a photograph of LA, we get the girl in the, in the, in the uh, bikini and the convertible and the pantry, and yet, I, I, you know, usually I, I don't see that. I mean, the, it does exist somewhere out there, but uh, for most of us, it's not the reality that we engage every day, right? Uh, so, and perhaps neither necessarily these ones, but this one I took in Guanajuato, right? But you can see, like this shrine, it was like that, you know. We have this shrine, and then people add all these uh, products there, like these Disney characters. These photographs, uh, some of them are more recent, some of them are more old. It's kind of, you know, a lot of them are like in the early, the early 90s. Uh, I, I'm gonna have a show at uh, Jan Kessner Gallery with recent stuff that I think it's, are like two portfolios that evolved from this thing. Uh, they're a little bit more eccentric, I guess, but um, it's, when it's in, a, in a restaurant in Mexico City, right? Yeah. And then, again, here in the murals, we have, we have Mickey, and then we have these two other characters, Walt Disney and, and the Nicaraguan uh, revolutionary Sandino, right? And, and then we can recognize, usually, depending on where you are in Mexico, Sandino would be more recognizable than Walt. Here, Walt could be more recognizable than Sandino. But of course, Mickey is the only one that really sense it's complex <laughs> and then uh, here uh, here we have uh, yeah well, like I know like, well this one some of them are a little bit manipulated I mean this one I you know have this Mickey piñata and we seen and there was this mural and the legend of the volcanoes is called this one I took you know the blessing of the cars this this car was called Black Beauty from Compton and then again you know they, this mishmash of things where everything sort of blends up and you know, the Mickey and the, and the thing. This one I like, right? Like this is a, this, this card was called the Trail of the Tears. And I see this, this one's like, I see these uh, this, uh, photographs uh, within certain traditions of, uh, photographic traditions, right? I mean, perhaps this is like a visual anthropology or some sort of ethnographic kind of stuff. Perhaps, but, but, it, but it was not telling, I, mean, I think these images are not talking about this pure, uh, idyllic sort of, uh, Situa uh, I don't know, uh, situations where, like a lot of Mexican photography would go on and document certain kind of indigenous uh, villages and these, uh, and idealize these modes of living uh, when, 
when at the same time this this somehow there's there's a this this modes of living are being are changing and people are uh, adapting to whatever is happening and and still keeping certain things and customizing or adapting other that's why i, I like the the whole strategy of customizing for me uh, uh, it's very fascinating because it adds layers and it's this complicated dial cultural dialogue uh, where there's not just one sense of authorship but there's this sort of shared or collective process of creating culture where you add to something that existed and then do you, whatever you do somebody, somebody else adds and that's and that. As opposed to the other, other postmodern strategies of uh, art production like appropriation or the really made, right? Uh, this is a photograph of, uh, well, these are like these wrestlers in Tijuana, but then again, they, they, they look like from a deep movie set or something, the, the, the devil clowns. Uh, I guess as you guys can see, uh, well, this one <laughs> doesn't need much to say. Uh, this one is in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, well, it was in uh, the Day of the Dead, right? Uh, the Day of the Dead here in LA, where, where, they, where there's this crossover between Day of the Dead, but also uh, the, you know, this performative aspect of dressing up, which I think has to do a little bit with Halloween as well, and this thing, and a very sort of uh, strong statement, I guess. I, I, I like this photograph a lot. It has this kind of, uh, reminds me of certain kind of uh, Posadas work, or Goya even, maybe, I don't know. Uh, this, is a, this is actually a dental shop in, <laughs> in Guatemala, but like this shrine to the tooth, or, I don't know, there was like this sort of, there. This actually, believe it or not, is, is a taco place in Mexico City uh, called UFO Tacos. Uh, and I like the, the, the Bart Simpson there, and pretty high tech stuff. Uh, well, this one again. These are the big ones. <laughs> Juan Jorge, Pablo, and Rengo. No, these are like. Uh, uh, yeah, it's like the Mexican Beatles. They, they, I have a, a movie, I did this movie uh, called Frontierland, which is experimental. Then again, this one. Uh, it's not kind of an explanation. Uh -huh. Yeah, this, this one is another one of my favorites. I took it in Hollywood Boulevard. And, and uh, it almost seems staged, but I, I could never... You see, I used to... Sometimes I don't have any prejudice in staging or constructing images or whatever. Not at all. Uh, it, I really see that, I don't see myself so much as somebody that is documenting these events as somebody that is just participating in the creation of culture and is as, uh, and I didn't think I, I am part of that as much as they are and we're all playing around and let's go. But the truth is, is that I don't like to, lately I don't like to, uh, to construct my images uh, that much because I, my constructions are never as good as what I have there. I mean, reality is way stranger than fiction. I mean, I could never come up with something as bizarre as, before, as much as I would think. Uh, of course, in Mexico, people have asked me, think, oh, and that shrine is Jesus Christ on the back? And of course, it's, it's, it's Rambo, right? This is Stallone, we can see him. And, <laughs> and, and then this guy sort of praying, or non-praying, but with camouflage, and the other guy in a state mental hospital, uh, it was an enigma, it's still to me, it's an enigma, I still trying to figure out what they were doing. And the, and the younger guy, I think he really had some sort of mental problem. Perhaps the other guy is a uh, Yeah, these are, uh, oh, this, <laughs> this is uh, some early work. I didn't want to show contemporary stuff, but uh, here comes one student, uh, body of work, just. Uh, when I was like, in Cal Arts, uh, I would go to the, to the, to the, um, uh, to the uh, uh, coffee shop or whatever, to the cafeteria, and and there were these guys that would work there, and these guys were very helpful because if you would be their friends, they would like cut you a deal always with the food, right? And and they were particularly helpful for the for the guys that did not have any money whatsoever. Uh, like I had a friend with this guitar player from El Salvador that was really really broke, and these guys really gave him a grant. <laughs> it wasn't because of these guys. You wouldn't have eaten, at least. So, uh, so one of these guys asked me, you know, what school are you? And I said, well, I'm in the art school. And he said, well, if you are an artist, why don't you make me a portrait? And then I said, yeah, why not? But yet, at the same time, I realized that nobody in that school could paint a portrait of nobody. <laughs> not even their life was at stake, right? 
and that at the same time I could paint his portrait, but then how would I show that to him to the, the, in a critique? You know, it's gonna be like here comes the this traditional painter, whatever, almost like a street painter. So then what I did is that I said, okay, let's see what I can. So I did this thing, and then I went to Tijuana and I commissioned a portrait with a street painter. This is a portrait of a conceptual artist that teaches there uh, called Michael Asher that uh, stopped painting. And, uh, and then uh, this other one, of this other uh, cook there. Actually, I like this one better. The other one I worked with, I took the slide before I finished it. I, I think it's a little bit better now, but still, these are the slides. So I took this photograph, and then I took this other photograph. I mean, and then I have this portrait of John Baldessari done commissioned to this uh, street painter in Tijuana. And as a result, I think I have this kind of interesting piece because it, from the perspective of the cooks, it's a collection of portraits. You know, somehow it died. And yet, if I would present this in a creed, it would become this conceptual art piece that also talks about my position within the school and, and some sort of a social uh, commentary as well. And, and a commentary about painting, I guess, and, and portrait and uh, art production and you know. so So it's a piece that I still like, although honestly it's uh, still work, right? Um, Let's see, oh well, from those days also there was this, uh, I don't know, what do I show? But this, this, I used to wear, wear baseball caps and this teacher said, stop wearing your, because I used to have ones with slogans in Spanish and this guy came with this Malcolm X cap and said, just wear it, but, uh, I mean, wear it, this is a real cap, this is what you should wear. So I said, okay. So then I, I adapted it, right? And I, and, and I did this thing. And, <laughs> and, and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought that was kind of cool because it would still be my thing, but still we'd pay homage to, to Malcolm X, right? And, and then I was taking this sculpture class where I thought I was going to be taught how to do sculptures, but they, of course that did not happen and they were, and, and then I ended up presenting this as a sculpture and, and, and it sort of uh, spawned, like after that like started doing a lot of them. Right? I started customizing some better than others, right? And I started bringing them to other places. And I made this very, very big, big collection, right? Uh, some are airbrush, some are like just. Uh, <laughs> and so then I kind of check out the detail. <laughs> so, so and, and then again, I really like them because it, they, this, we see this somehow to a certain degree. I mean, we see these things on the streets. I mean, kids, you see, when, when kids wear either blue caps or red caps, and they say, well, I'm going to wear blue, or, or, or certain, you see, a, a, a lot of people in the car shows would wear, would wear Cleveland Browns caps, because I'm brown and white, right? And, and so there was this level of appropriation of the, of the iconography that, in the beginning, the iconography, so, the, some, I mean, and also this iconography, it's an appropriation of other sorts. So you, you have on one hand, like these teams taking certain kind of logos, but then kids use them and reappropriate those logos and change the meaning. And, and you know, whatever it used to be, like the like Washington Hoyas, then if you, depending on the neighborhood you are, it means something or something else. And I thought this was a very complicated level uh, uh, of uh, semiotical sort of game there. So, so then I, I think this, 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 uh, this cap sort of, uh, play within, within those uh, sort, of, uh, sort of games, right? Uh, this, for example, this kind of games I like a lot where, where I have the original logo, I have like this, whatever, uh, registered Aztec mark, uh, and then I would go with some artisan in, 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 in Mexico, in a little village in Mexico or in Guatemala, and I would say, do, uh, do your version of this other guy. And then, so we have this, again, this, 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 this telephone game, right? Okay, you do my version of, you do the representation of me, I do a representation of you, and, and I keep on adding, right? And, uh, and the collection, uh, these ones are the first ones that I did and, and I documented, but uh, yeah, the Albuquerque views. They are the, the, one of the, the Dodgers uh, farm fields uh, in the Cleveland Indians. These I like, then the Albuquerque views, but then, with uh, this other Aztec uh, iconography around it. This one's this one just abstract. I mean, I, I, in Guatemala, in this woman used to do a lot of designs based on birds. So I just said, well, what, how would you respond to this bird? And she just did flowers. And so this one, this one doesn't have a, it means more formalist, I guess. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and the birds. And so, oh, this one, this one I went to Lapland. 
So, so the, and then the, these Laponians, uh, they said that they would still do these Viking designs uh, with, uh, with silver thread. So somehow these are designs are based on, on Viking runes. And uh, which, of course, and then it was a, quite a disappointment for me to discover in Sweden that uh, the Viking helmets don't have horns. It's just like, well, <laughs> it was like uh, the, the late motif of the Viking helmet is, of course, an artificial construction, I guess invented in, in German, invented uh, for German operas. Uh, but, um, okay, so, so I did those. I have more recent ones that I really like, uh, ones that involve a lot, the, the San Diego Padres I've been doing too, with those and, and other things. Uh, let's see if we can focus this. This is a very crazy thing, uh, and I don't know, I don't know exactly how it works, but it turns out that I went to Belfast. I was in Ireland in this, uh, working on this exhibition. And when I was there, uh, I got into this kind of very complicated situation where there was this cultural festival, and these guys, all of a sudden, I realized that I was expected to paint a mural, right? Uh, in West Belfast, which is the this Republican neighborhood. And, and I, you know, I said, well, first of all, I said, well, I'm a Mexican artist, but not all Mexican artists do murals. And I don't do murals. But this guy said, ah, well, we thought you were going to, you have to do one because it became this sort of very sort of complicated diplomatic situation where, and I said, well, okay, let's do it. Uh, not to say that, not to make the story long, it became this very complicated adventure that really involved all sorts of risky things and, 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 and checkpoints and soldiers asking questions and, and, and I always thought, well, Mexican is as radical as they were, I don't think they ever had to confront a platoon of soldiers in front of them and a helicopter when you're doing a mural. And I, I did that thing that it's on the, on the, on the, on the top left uh, photograph. The, the mural, I, I, there, I mean, I, at the beginning, I tried to do something that would be a little bit more creative. I said, well, you know, Mexican heroes and stuff, it's been done before. Why don't we try <laughs> something else? And no, 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 you know, this, we need these Irish heroes, Mexican heroes. The, the, the English soldiers come and they throw paint on top of the, of the murals. They paint bomb the murals. And, and I thought, well, if they do that, why don't we put these drippings and we do this part of the mural that is abstract expressionist. And when these guys drop the painting, it sort of incorporates in the, in the process of the work. And it's a collaboration where you can participate. But of course, it didn't fly. It was just like, we are not going to throw paint on our murals and do the heroes and that's it. OK. So, so then the thing is that the painting had to be done very flat because if you do something complicated with different tonalities and shades, then the neighbor's country story. And the idea is that when the, it has to, if it's done in flat colors, when these guys throw the paint, the neighbors can come out and restore the thing. So, so I said, okay, so I did this drawing and this crazy situation. And then at the end, at the, at the, the missing thing for me is that at the end, the result looked very familiar because I had these heroes, guys with guns, badly painted, outside the, 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 the wall. It totally looked like a lay. I mean, it looked like a, like a gangster mural. So, so I, I said, wow, we achieved something here, somehow, that I never expected. But we created the, fir the, the first uh, international uh, barrier thing or something. So, uh, barrier mural. So I took photographs, I documented it, and I sent the photographs to this magazine, Teen Angels, that, that prints out, uh, in this form, they print out uh, the, the iconography from the barriers and gangs and stuff. Although, in this case, as you guys can see, they, well, they don't, I mean, the Belfast Barrio, I mean, it's a different story, right? So, and then on the, on the left corner, we see like the real photograph of Tino Angels, and then the other three that I sent and that they put there. The, the, the one on the top right uh, is this very strange image I found in Belfast where uh, they were advertising Irish beer with these Mexican looking guys, supposedly saying that Harps was the beer uh, Mexican drinks. And, and I suppose because Corona is very popular, now the cool thing is to say that Mexicans drink Irish. <laughs> but uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, this, this, this is the other side of the thing, you know, like uh, I call this other collage, like uh, the, the British invasion. And, and we have, these are like the, the loyalist murals that their iconography is more sort of Rococo and, and monarchic, as you guys can see. And, and I fitted my needles there. 
but you know, and, and, and they, did they have King Billy of Orange? I mean, some other Republicans, uh, the aesthetics are more like 20th century, kind of like uh, 60s kind of look, like revolutionary radical thing. But this, guy, this stuff is more like a Rococo, old school, uh, you know, like the painting of King Billy on the top left, and then this, this new version of King Billy. It was crazy there. And, uh, okay. This one, well, another version in this kind, in this kind of format, then again, of the, those two charts that you guys saw. Well, Notre Dame. <laughs> and then, uh, okay, let's see what else I included here. Well, this is a simple thing. I did my movie, and then I did a banner of my movie, because in Mexico they used to airbrush a long time ago, these big banners to advertise films. And I grew up watching those big banners, and I love them. A very pop, very big size. So I did one for my movie. But then I hired the same guy, and I gave him all these clips from the newspapers. And, and, and so we did this as if it was a movie, uh, but, 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 I, but all these clips are like uh, talk about recent incidents that had happened in 1994. Uh, so we see the Mexican president in a hunger strike and the guy that was killed. But it was presented like a, like a comedy, like one of these movies. And needless to say that it created a riot when I presented this. And I thought the format I kind of like because it refers to media, you know, the, the movie banner, but it's also in its size, it's like this portable mural that you can fold or you can display again like a mural. And so I kind of thought, well, there's like a narrative. This one, this one is even, I mean, uh, there's not, I just found these scenes in the, in the, in the, in the, in the newsstand and then I place them together and, and, and like if it was a movie with this content, right? Because these banners actually have, they are very sexualized, but usually they are very macho oriented movies. So I thought, well, let's put this thing <laughs> that would like sort of revert that kind of a macho thing and, and I display it there as a, as a movie banner, right? Of course the movie not, didn't exist. And then they did this like kind of like for a sci-fi film that uh, has, then again, the guys from Rancho Santa Fe, the self-portrait of those guys that were going to go to outer space, and then these guys with this border patrol and high-tech, you know, ex infrared mission goggles and, 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 and uh, I don't know, ET and the Chupacabras and, you know, some sort of border type of thing. This, this one's, uh, I don't think too much lately, but I did this uh, series of uh, kind of like self-portraits, I guess, because the, the puppets have, parts of them are sort of anthrop anthropomorphized and sort of relate to me. So I did this one, and this is a series of four. This one, another. I like this one, it's another classic uh, dark Vader bit. Check out the trousers, awesome. This look, and uh, well, this one's, I don't know, this, this uh, can you get a little bit of focus? It's a little bit out of focus, but, but then again, I guess you've seen those guys that do these spray paint sci-fi things. So I just customized it, and I added like these lowrider aliens. They always, for some strange reason, when you go to the market, they always have lowrider stickers and alien stickers together. <laughs> so I just blended one to those together, and 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 in this like sci-fi thing. Uh, and I just did when I was doing these drawings, right? These were my early designs for the my early drawings for the car. Uh, originally, that's what I wanted to do before uh, I, Salvador. This wanted me to use his truck, right? Originally, I wanted to use the truck in the video, but I wanted to construct this device, this car that where I could drive to the to the gallery and then from the drive from the gallery to the car show and and so on, right? Or I could drive back and forth, it's out of work, come back, and have these hydraulic systems that would project. Um, I don't know. I guess I think that it would sort of relate to those Soviet trains that project movies in the. In the, in the revolution and bring movies to the to the masses, but I would go in my low rider, <laughs> bringing. Uh, so that, this was where my original sketch. This is another version. This one involved having a big monitor there, as opposed to the other one, uh, and you know, other versions. And then of course the, the the final version, which is way more interesting than whatever I was thinking of, uh, thanks to to Salvador's uh, participation, right? Uh, this, is, this is another very interesting piece and another very in interesting story that maybe you guys have heard. I picked up certain uh, uh, things that I thought could be here interesting in, in, in Sayar. This guy, his name is Cody Sanchez. And I don't know if you guys have heard of the whole uh, story about the leaf blowers that were banned 
and then the gardeners, uh, they couldn't use this machine, and, and if they would use it, they, they would have to pay a fine of $1,000, and if they would get caught three times, they would have to go 25 years for the prison, and all these things, because the machine is noisy, and, 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 and it pollutes, right? Uh, according to uh, the Catwoman, or this thing, I don't know, her, but the actress that played Catwoman is the one that uh, actually was the one that went and did the whole thing against, against the Lindler. Newman, something Newman, I forget her name. So anyway, so Gaudi, so this on the, 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 the gardeners went on hunger strike. And while they were on hunger strike, um, they appeared on the news and it was becoming this dramatic uh, struggle, right, uh, for the leaf blower. Because they, without the leaf blower, they would have to do twice the amount of work for uh, the same pay, basically. And uh, so they really wanted to make the city have a compromise because on another hand, whenever uh, like a factory pollutes and the city decides that it needs to raise the standards uh, of, uh, to, or to lower the pollution, uh, whatever, there's a certain time for it to. But anyway, so this guy saw that thing on the TV and, and according to him, God told him how to fix the problem. So he went down to his garage took out the electric battery of his car, uh, stuck it into the leaf blower, added an, an electric motor, and created this concoction, right? So the guy went to the, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the city hall, presented this, and it was a big media success, right? All of a sudden, uh, wow, they realized that the problem perhaps was not so much, uh, it was a problem that not just had to do with uh, uh, it was not just a social problem, but it also was a problem of faulty design. I mean, it's a problem that, you know, with a better industrial design, with a better machine, you know, you could have a machine that does not pollute and does not make noise. Uh, and Gaudi proved that, right? Uh, this is his ver first version, that it was not really strong. That's uh, his plan, which includes, like, all these biblical quotes, the drawing. And then, then he made a second other machine, which is the one on the right. And the one on the right, he wanted to make one more powerful, but yet that would not uh, make noise, right? So then he kept the, 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 the engine, the, the, the two-cycle engine, but he put like a filter so it wouldn't pollute, and he added this filter that takes out the noise. And this filter that takes out the noise comes from an AK-47. It's a silencer. That he took it from the machine gun <laughs> and stuck it in the in the. That's creativity, man. That's that's that's. And the guy created this. So there's now two versions: one powerful, the other one with less power. Yet both. And this one, for some strange reason, the silencer produces this this liquid, this water, this uh, that he even uses to to. He says that he could recycle by throwing that water. Uh, into the dust, so it doesn't leave dust. And, and, and he couldn't explain where the water was coming from, and of course, it had to be with God, and therefore he even throws holy water. So, uh, and he's, he's, he's a job and witness, and he's very, very convincing. Um, so then, you know, a little bit of the design here, and uh, we can see here on the back, you know, thanks to my God to give me this dream that now is a reality because God is almighty and, and so on. So, so he, uh, okay, it's another photograph of him. Okay, and now, well, these are the machines. That's, yeah, the one, the one here is the one with the silencer, right? So we, I invited uh, him, and I said, let's go, let's, let's participate in a show. There was this show in San Diego, which was called Design Worlds. And it was about uh, industrial design and graphic design and design in general. And they invited me to participate. And of course, I said, well, I don't know if I can do much design, but this guy definitely. <laughs> so, so then I invited him, and, and, and I created this kind of like low, right, low, low, well, I guess this lip lower club. And, and I customized one. <laughs> this is mine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this is his. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and I, I think these two, of course, me being an artist, I had to do like a beautiful one, <laughs> but that does not work, I mean, that, that pollutes and makes noise, right? And it has 24 karat gold, and a candy, uh, you know, candy, uh, apple candy job, and uh, 
in here, yeah, well, yeah, the whole works. The whole engine is, is, by the way, the whole engine is gold plated. Every screw, everything in the tier. Just, there was just one part that wouldn't take the gold, but the whole engine is gold plated. At, uh, and then we have, we have his. His uh, is all crappy and rusty and all the things, but does the job. So there you have a, a comment about design, right? Uh, amazing enough, I must say that it's a piece that uh, particularly I don't know why machines just attract people. I was showing this in San Diego, and there were a lot of guys would come and ask me where do they sell them. That you know, <laughs> the, the soup dog. Uh, this is a last series of paintings that I did for this show. I was invited in Mexico, and then again uh, collaborating with uh, with a car painter. Uh, I did this. I went to these minimalist monochrome paintings. I said, well, uh, and and so we created these uh, ones where it's kind of a monochrome painting. Uh, it's the same color. It has this uh, candy, uh, this candy uh, coat, but it has different metallic faces. So we see this pattern. Uh, this, this is another one. And these are not too good slides. I mean, uh, these are just reference slides that I took uh, while I was working on them in the garage. Uh, but uh, but these are serious. I want to work more on them because I think that the of course, like this sort of sublime kind of a form of art needs lowrider painting. And uh, this, well, these are a couple of pieces that, this, this is gonna, this is gonna talk about the last piece I'm working on. Uh, I'm gonna show uh, at the Getty uh, this uh, Saturday and I hope you guys uh, can go see it. Uh, this one actually is, is related to it, but it's, uh, it's a, this is a print, I was invited to do this print. And, and I thought, uh, well, I was doing this, this print about prints, and somehow by, by the time I was, in, when I was invited to do my print, at the same time I was being, I had to give my fingerprints to the FBI because I was sort of arranging my, my papers, uh, hopefully, uh, my alien thing. And, and then uh, I was, I look, I found this image, this photograph. Uh, I found this photograph of Che Guevara's fingerprints when he was assassinated in Bolivia. And, and I thought it was an interesting image because usually we think of photography as evidence, right? Photography, it's been used, it's called, well, we use photography as an evidence of things. But in this case, the evidence is not so much the photograph as it is the print of his fingerprints. And therefore, to make a lithograph of that, I mean, would create this whole dialogue about what, you know, what it's, uh, what, here, what is the evidence? And in this case, what, uh, who's the author and all that? Because it, the, that piece is not signed, but it has my fingerprints. And this, in order to see the authorship of the piece, you have to see the files from the FBI. That kind of thing. But anyway, the piece that I'm going to do, uh, that I'm going to do at the Getty involves, it's based on this car, which is a Chevy 1960. It's actually not an Impala, it's a Bel Air. And it was driven uh, by uh, Comandante Che Guevara in Cuba. Uh, so, uh, I was invited, the, 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 the project in the Getty, uh, I was invited to do an artwork in relation to their uh, permanent collection, right? And of course you guys would think, well, what, what does this have to do about with the permanent collection? But uh, finally, I mean, for me the most interesting part of the Getty uh, is not so much the painting collection as it is the photo, the photo collection and the research center. They have this incredible place, which is the research center, where it's usually not on display to the public, but you can go there. They have text, these very important text of important uh, writers and documents and photographs and things. And I found this, this box of stereographic cards that, you know, in 3D of the Spanish-American War. And these very beautiful images uh, show those, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders uh, on campaign in Cuba, the defeated Spanish soldiers, the Cuban rebels that were about to defeat the Spanish soldiers when the Americans intervened, uh, they are also called as the Mambis, right? And then also has a lot of images of, of daily life. Kind of like a CNN, it's almost called like a contemporary news show because you have certain battle scenes and then how people live there, the sunken boats and so on. So then I thought that somehow those photographs were very interesting, you know, were stereographic, were in 3D, but at the same time, um, we talk about certain uh, kind of, you know, clash or situation that uh, um, that somehow I think it's embodied by this car. Because this car embodies two different ideas of, of, of freedom, I guess, right? On one hand, the American car with all its commodities and, 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 and luxury and style. And on another, another hand, the, the, the icon of Che Guevara, right? This, 
radical, uh, romantic guy that uh, died uh, trying to liberate the whole continent and, and so on. Uh, so then, uh, then I thought, well, that somehow this this card perhaps embodied uh, some kind of the contradictions that existed in the stereographic art. And and then what I did is I did this sort of travelogue uh, film, sort of based on uh, on. Uh, on this car, and, and also incorporating uh, a lot of images from, from, from Havana, because it turns out that I got, uh, the, the, weird enough, the, the real capital of the American car is Havana. <laughs> is, you would see the most incredible American cars running there. Like, you take a taxi, and, and the taxi happens to be a 59 Chevy Impala, uh, you know. And so I did that. The other element of, the, of that piece, uh, that I will show is that it turns out that my dad, as, as Gustavo explained, uh, was a, a folk singer in Latin America and he wrote a song that became very well known in Latin America that this Chilean singer sang that was called La Samba del Che. So what I wanted to do is have Che Guevara's car dancing to my dad's song. Uh, so I customized my dad's song and it, now it's called La Samba del Che and then I will have Che Guevara's customized dancing to my dad's song. Uh, the car, I have it, it's in the Getty, I don't have photographs yet, and, and I have 3D video, but in order to see 3D video, you have to have a 3D projector and glasses for everybody. We will have those at the, at the Getty, so I will invite you to see that. But I think we can hear a little bit of the song, uh, which is, track, no, track one is a small, shorter, so let's listen to track one. Uh, so which is my dad's song, uh, Arranged. That's, that's what I brought down uh, for today. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any questions. Uh, I hope you, I didn't overwhelm you with all this stuff. Um, Have a beer. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> ah, we have to put everything together. He went over to East LA.